Okay, good morning, everyone. Today is Friday, the 16th day of the month of Shabbat. Chad is back. Chad, you can come up when you're ready and sit with us here. Today, the 16th of Shabbat, the 26th of January, we conclude chapter 21 in the Tanya. And we're going to continue this concept. I want to just preface the uh, the class with this idea of uh, what I shared years ago. Um, for those that are into sports, even if you're not, I think you'll understand this muscle. That sometimes, uh, you know, you see the you see the players on the floor, obviously, or on the field. You see the coaches, but you don't always see what's going on in the back office, and. Sometimes in the back office, they're making moves. They're putting players in place that are very young. And you're like, how come we have that guy on the field? He doesn't know what he's doing. And they know, based on the scouting reports, that he has a lot of potential. So they as they use this concept of trust the process. Trust the process. In two, three years, he's going to be one of the best players. Right now, maybe he's not going to win Rookie of the Year. He might. But there has to be... There has to be a perfect fusion of all the different pieces that we put in place. There's the Wiley veteran. There's some of the stable, you know, get on base guys. There's some of the three-point shooters that are great, you know, mixing different sports, obviously. But then there's the one guy that's the unknown, or even the two, three guys that we don't know. Why, why did you bring this guy in? You know, you made a trade for him. It didn't seem like it makes sense. He says, trust the process. If you join us on Zoom, please put yourself on mute. I have to figure out how to do that automatically, but as yet, I haven't figured it out. So just do it for me. Please have a good day. Now, <laughs> the same thing is when it comes to learning, oftentimes, Tyra, when it comes to the Gemara, for sure, you start learning and you end up on like, how do we get to this subject? How do we get here? And to try to get back to the starting point is sometimes very difficult. It's like, you know, if you take a hike in woods and you're going and you're going, you're walking, like, how did I get here? Hopefully you can make your way back to the starting point and you won't be lost. Sometimes you come out, if you go on a hike by the reservation, you come out on a different side. You don't know how to get back to the starting point, but you know that you're on South Orange Avenue. And if you walk up to uh, Pleasant Valley Way, you can make a right and you're back to where your car is. So sometimes the Gemara works that way. It takes you on a long journey. And now we're in the Tanya. And we're discussing that Hashem put himself through all sorts of different symptoms, all sorts of different contractions to the point that he is unrecognizable in this world. Let's take it one step further, which is crazy, that people deny the existence of God. And before we even continue that thought, it's like, why are we discussing this? But that's when I say, please trust the process, because the whole purpose of the learning today and throughout the Tanya is to understand how to perform a mitzvah with love and fear of Hashem. al Rebbe tells us it's very easy. Okay, so just tell us. In one minute, he can tell us, oh, here's what you do. But it's not like that. We go on a journey, and there's a long process, and sometimes there are twists and turns. We don't understand why we're discussing this particular Indian, but slowly but surely, we'll come back, and there will be a, an aha moment where we'll say, ah, that's why we had to go in a roundabout way. Steve, you're going to show me after how to do it, okay? Uh, you did it? You did it for me? So now, today, the godly energy was veiled through Tzimtzumim, okay? We say there's a... We, we talk about this in brief. Those that come to Tanya Shir regularly and those that come to the class Shabbos afternoon, we learn in the Maimar, we learn it, said this, that there's a great godly light. It's called the eternal light. It's so powerful, it's so strong. And if that light would try to create the world, it wouldn't. It wouldn't be able to. It would be like taking a match and holding it up or throwing it into the sun. It doesn't exist. You know, we, we talked about this numerous times here. The world is 92 million miles away from the sun, right? The earth. What if it was 91? One mile closer. Big deal, right? 91 million miles instead of 92 million miles. We wouldn't exist. Right? Even a half a mile closer, it would be we would be burning. Our skin would be blistering all day. Saw this clip of this the coldest place on earth. It's somewhere like in Uzbekistan. You know, uh, there's two months a year that it's nice and warm and comfortable. It reaches the highest. It reaches like 86, but it's usually in the 60s, 70s, really comfortable. 
But for the rest of the year, it is rigid. And most of the winter, it's like 50 below. It's like you could only go outside for five minutes a day. I mean, I'm sorry, five minutes at a time. People leave their car running all night long. Most people don't have cars. They just take the taxis. The taxis just leave their cars running. It's like this insane thing. They have like they have a few people that run these open air markets outside. And the fish, everything is just frozen. It's frozen solid. It's like frigid. The flip side is that, that we can somehow figure out a way how to exist. It's very difficult. And they ask the people, why would you even live there? My opinion, it should be illegal to live there. <laughs> like Minnesota, you shouldn't be able to live there. It's illegal. In the winter, it's too cold. But the flip side is, if it was too hot, you know, if it's too cold, you put on layers and layers and layers and layers and go indoors. If it was too hot, if it were too close to the sun, everything would just cease to exist. It's like taking a match and throwing it into a, a huge bonfire. Where's the match? Is the flame giving anything? Is it? Does it have any purpose of the match? No. So Hashem had to conceal that light, that energy, in order to create the world, in order for anything to be into, in existence. So through all these contractions, the created world, and there, therefore appears to be separate from Hashem, because the concealment is so great. However, from God's perspective, there's absolutely no concealment. Everything is just exactly the way it was before. And you see, God does not change. One iota. Okay, inside, page 102, Charlie. <laughs> All these contractions, these veilings of God's countenance, of God's light, conceal the face, so to speak, of the life force that come from God's word, as we've been talking about extensively. God's word is different than our word. God's word creates things. Our words just disappear after we speak about them, right? After they come out of our mouths, takes a moment, they're gone. But God's word is forever. And they become veiled so that they should not reveal itself with an intense radiance, which the lower worlds would be incapable of receiving. So they're covered up completely. God's word and light is hidden in this world. This world is called olam. The word olam is the same word, basically the same root word as elam, which means hidden. That's why the word olam was chosen to, to, uh, to give description to this is what we're in as the world. Therefore, two, because it is thus obscured through tzimtzumim, the light and life force of God's word, that is clothed in them appears to them as if it is something separate from God. If we think and we if we think that there is God, I mean we know, but if we want to discover God in the world, we'll say it's completely hidden. But even if it's here, it's separate from Hashem. It's a it's some kind of light that God sent down, but it's not part of Him anymore. If there's holiness in the book, this book we don't want to put it on the floor. It's holy. We kiss it, just like we have the Torah in the Ark. It's very holy. But we're very careful what we do with it. We don't put it on the floor. Why? Because we feel that there's godliness in it. But even that godliness, we feel to a certain extent is separate from a God. It's here in this world. God is up there. Right? This false perception of the godly life force as something separate from God is possible only because the life force is hidden from creation by means of numerous contractions and veils. Ah. Regarding from Hashem's perspective, there's no concealment, there's no veil, there's nothing that obscures him. Darkness, concealment, and light are the same. Dark, light, good, evil, this world, that world, upper worlds, heavens, everything is the same to God. Unity of God, that's it. The Pasuk says, even the darkness does not obscure anything from you. The room is completely dark. You can't see anything. It's hard to walk through that room. You go in the hallway there and the light's off. You're feeling your way around. It's uncomfortable. There is no darkness for God. So this may also be interpreted as even the darkness does not obscure because it comes from Hashem. 
meaning the veil of Tzimtum itself is of divine origin, and therefore it cannot obscure godliness. As the Alter Rebbe goes on to say, only a foreign body can constitute an obstruction. One cannot hide from oneself. You can't, you, 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 we can't use our hand as a yarmulke. You're covering your, yourself with yourself. Somebody else, there's a video from, uh, I don't know if it was in Gaza, but the idea of soldiers, they were doing, maybe a, they were getting a bracha, or they were saying a bracha, or maybe they were saying kiddush, something like that, and they were sitting together. So each of them put their hand on the guy next to him. You saw that? So that, you know, if you're doing a yarmulke and they don't have, and that's fine because they're, serving, you know, they're they're fighting the good fight right now. So they put the yarmulke, their hand as a kippah on the guy next to them. Because your own hand doesn't help. It's you. You can't cover yourself. Just like we can't, we are not separate from ourselves. The symptom and the veils are not distinct from Hashem. They're distinct for us. For us, God is obscured and God is hidden and God is veiled. But for Hashem, he can't veil himself. Here's a mushal. Ela, ehodein kimtsa levushah minei uvei. Kimtsa levushah minei uvei. Like the turtle or snail, whose garment, meaning its shell, is part of its body. So to the very shell, the process of symptom that, had, that hides Hashem, is Hashem. You don't say that the, 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 the shell of the turtle was separate from the turtle. It's part of the turtle. Actually, that's what it's known for. The Postal Six says, God is the Lord, as explained elsewhere. In Hebrew, the divine name of Ayah, Yud Kevavke, is Elikim. The four letter name of God denotes divine revelation and transcendence, while the name Elikim refers to God's power of self concealment by which he vests himself in creation. Seems like two different things, but it's one thing. The equation points out that they are one. Elikim is godly, just as the level of godliness signifies by the, signified by the other name. Thus, Elikim does not act as a veil obscuring God, since it is essentially one with Yud Kev the power of revelation. Therefore, in Hashem's presence, all else is of absolutely no account. Since Hashem is not affected by the symptom, the contractions and the veils, which makes it possible for a created being to feel separate from him, he, he, Hashem, perceives all the creations brought into being by his word as being still within their source, which is himself. There they are in a state of absolute nullification. From Hashem's perspective, they are non-entities, and the fact of their creation in no way detracts from his absolute unity. He is one alone after creation, just as he was one and alone before creation. So what's the takeaway for today, Chavra? From our mundane perspective, from our viewpoint and vantage point, God is concealed within the world. Can we see God? Can we feel God? We're, we're striving constantly to seek him out. We may have moments of feeling that we are connected to him. But we can't see God. We can't see a revelation of godliness. Maybe the prophets had some level of godliness. Moshe Rabbeinu went on the mountain and had a communication with God. But for the rest of us, please put your phone on mute. I'm sorry. When we start seeing the world from Hashem's perspective, then things start to change. Let me start over. The takeaway is from our mundane perspective, God is concealed within the world. Let's start seeing the world from God's perspective, how it is all just an extension of himself. So when something happens, we get angry, we get frustrated. It's just divine providence. This is divine providence, just like we said before. God is the darkness. He's not, he can't, he can't be hidden in the darkness because he is the darkness. So if there's something that happens which seems out of the ordinary, even if it's not bad necessarily, we say, this is Hashem. Showing us a sign. We can't necessarily see it, but when we look at it from this perspective, and when we say that everything in the world is God, when we say every morning, we say Shema every day, many multiple times, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, we're not saying that there's one God. We're, and we're not just saying that God is, you know, there's unity in God, but that it, there is only God. Everything that happens and everything that we experience in this world 
is only a Kaddish Baruch Hu. And hopefully, and by the way, that's going to bring us one step closer to the original, the original motivation for this whole, the whole purpose of learning this Tanya, which is we can love God and fear God because when we realize that everything is God, we're one step closer to be able to perform the commandments, learn Torah, do a mitzvah, be kind to others with the idea that we're loving Hashem because if we love God's people and we love the Torah, we're one step closer to loving Hashem. How could we love something that we can't feel, hear, touch, smell, you know, have that kind of relationship with? So we're doing that through this process of understanding that really it's all God. God wants us to feel independent. God wants us to have free choice. But when we start thinking from that other perspective, from the nefesh elikis mindset, the godly soul wants to be godly. What is God? Everything. The animal soul wants to feel selfish and worry about itself. When you're selfish, you feel separate. separate. You feel alone. It's a very lonely place, so we don't want to go there. When we're united, when we're feeling like godly, then we're united with everything. We get one step closer to successfully having love and awe and fear of Hashem while we perform every possible mitzvah that comes our way. Until then, not until then. As you do that, have a wonderful day and a wonderful Shabbos. This Shabbos is Shabbos Shira when we sing and we dance and we praise Hashem for the wonderful things that He did to us then and He continues to do for us every single day.